Assalamu alaikum. We'll be looking at the spinal cord as well as the ascending and descending tracks. The lecture will be divided into three parts. <coughs> Firstly, we'll be looking at the gross anatomy as well as the blood supply and the meningeal layers which are covering the spinal cord and just a bit on the vertebral column. The vertebrae because they have a uh, they're associated with the spinal cord very closely. So let's begin. In front of you, you see a whole lot of image uh, parts. So I'm just going to isolate the spinal cord so that it's really easier for you to appreciate its overall shape and appearance. And for that, I'm going to have to hide the meningeal layer. And here we go. Also have to hide the arachnoid layer. We'll get to this actually. Just want to show you the shape of the spinal cord, and from there we'll go upwards. And lastly, the pia mater as well. Finally, now if you look at it grossly, <coughs> you will notice that it is a longitudinal structure, and the extent is from the brain stem region, which is hidden up above all the way down below till the conus medullaris also hidden. Well, I'll, be, I'll be make the visible in a moment. The important thing to note is that the entirety of the spinal cord, it's part of the central nervous system, but there are two areas in which there are dilatations. Normally, if you were to look at it from a cross section, and I have a cross sectional image as well, so it gives a bit of a cylindrical shape. The size is uniform except at two regions, one near the neck and one near the lumbar region. It is because in those regions you have the cervical plexus coming outside and down below the vertebral plexus, although not very easily appreciable here. But because the spinal cord in general receives sensory input and gives off the motor output, your legs and your arms, since they are part of the appendicular muscular system and they have a lot of muscles there, they need more nerve supply. So it makes sense that the nerves going there from the spinal cords, that part of the spinal cord would be dilated. Again, it's not that easily appreciable here, but I'll find a better image to show you. Now then, <coughs> this is an MCQ that they do ask that where are the dilatations of the spinal cord. You have to mention the cervical, where the cervical plexus and brachial plexus are coming. It's more towards the brachial plexus, actually, sorry, it's the brachial plexus. Cervical is up in the neck. Brachial, that's where your arm is visible. As you can see, the arm right here. And down, down below, the lumbar plexus, which goes to the legs. If I were to just enable them for you, just to give you a clear idea. Here we go, anatometry. I will just enable the lumbar plexus right here. Here we go. Spinal nerves, lumbar spinal nerves. Oh, not really. I guess they don't have the entire plexus actually. But uh, let's see here. Let me try the brachial plexus. Nerves of upper limb, nerves of left upper limb. Here we go the left brachial plexus. Let's enable that for a moment. Now, I'm going to zoom in on this. Now, see the position actually. You learned this in first year. These nerves which go to your upper limb, in this case this is the left upper limb, the point where they come from the spinal cord, although those nerves are not visible, but at this region, that is where the spinal cord is dilated. It is more thicker as compared to the other parts. Having that said, let us disable this and focus on the rest. Now, the entirety of the spinal cord from the top part is covered in meningeal layer. If I were to take it all the way up here, what you're seeing here actually is not the brain, but actually the meningeal layer covering the brain. There we go. 
So I'm just going to hide this so that we can appreciate the structure's underlying. Right, we'll click this now. Here we go. Now this is a very a nice view of the posterior view of the brain stem. You can appreciate the midbrain on top, the pawns in here, and the medulla down below. Notice how it blends in with the spinal cord. As the spinal cord passes through the foramen magnum, here it is joining with the um, it is joining with the brain stem, the medulla. Here you can appreciate the fourth ventricle and the cerebellum is hidden, that's why you cannot see the cerebellum. Now, what I want to show is that over here, the entirety of the spinal cord is covered in three layers. The one which I disabled in the beginning, the pia matter, the arachnoid, and the dura matter. Now, they extend from all the way from the neck down to below. So, there is an MCQ that they do ask regarding these meningeal layers. If you see down below here, notice that the spinal cord first and foremost is tapering off in a very cone-like shape. This is your conus medullaris. The conus medullaris is nothing but the spinal cord tapering off. But down below, this is not part of the spinal cord. It is actually a part of the pia matter. When the pia matter converges at this point, it forms a bit of a thick cord and this cord extends all the way down and attaches to the coccyx bone which is not visible here but this is the site of the coccyx. This is your phylum terminal. So here's a question that they do ask in the MCQs. Colus medullaris and the phylum terminal. The phylum terminalis is actually a part of the pia matter. And keep in mind between the pia matter and the arachnoid that's where you have the cerebrospinal fluid. Now I'll try to re-enable those layers again so you can appreciate those layers. Here we go. I think I have enabled the PM matter. This is the PM matter and if I were to again here you have the arachnoid. Notice the web-like appearance that's why it gives it name arachnoid. It is Greek for spider. So it is between the pia and the arachnoid that you have, or rather it is within the arachnoid layer that you have the cerebrospinal fluid bathing the entire spinal cord. <laughs> and keep in mind, the cerebrospinal fluid is also within the central canal, which I'll show you in the next. Okay, and covering this, we have the dura matter. Here's another important thing to show you. Notice how at this dura matter, you can see some of it is extending to the side. This is actually covering the spinal nerves coming out. I have disabled the spinal nerves at this region. But if you were to go upwards, right over here, where you see all these spinal nerves of the thoracic region coming out. Now notice over here, you can once again see the dura mater covering those regions. And this is where the spinal nerve comes out, the spinal root, not visible here. So from the spinal root, you will have the spinal nerves coming out. And each of these will then branch off into the anterior, posterior, and lateral branches. And they have their own blood supply. <coughs> now, regarding blood supply, on the back side, you've probably already seen these two branches, but ignore them for now. I want you to focus on the main one right in front. These are your two vertebral arteries. They actually come from the subclavian artery down below of the heart. From the subclavian artery, as they ascend, and also they're passing through the transverse process of the vertebra. And I might as well, better I show you that actually. If I were to enable the vertebra of the cervical region, you will see, you can appreciate how these arteries are actually passing through those transverse processes. And here we go. Look at that, very nice. This is your transverse process, and you can appreciate how the vertebral artery is passing through them. It will ultimately enter via the foramen magnum inside the brain, or on the brain, not inside it, and it will actually converge into the basilar artery, right over here. Zooming in, I will disable these uh, blue veins for now, so that you are not confused. 
let's remove this basal plexus as well as this vertebral plexus. They're part of the venous system, but I think you can ignore them for now. Notice how the two vertebral arteries, they are converging in front of the brain stem and they're forming this nice basilar artery on the basilar groove of the pons. And it's from these two vertebral arteries that you have three more branches. Number one, the anterior spinal artery, right in front. Not this one, uh, this one. Let me remove this meningeal layer again, it's in the way. Moving the arachnoid layer and the spinal pia mater. Here we go. Right here you have the anterior spinal artery in the anterior fissure. Going all the way down. <coughs> So the origin, and it's an MCQ question, the origin of this is actually your two vertebral arteries. They are supported by radicular arteries from the uh, spinal nerves. Again, not visible here. So I'll show you them in the next uh, 3D image that we have. On the back side, however, and as a matter of fact, I'll show you another branch of, before going to the back side, let's look at the side way. The vertebral artery, before they form the basilar, they give off one small branch the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. Here we go. This one. Posterior inferior cerebellar artery. And for those of you who have read through the brainstem, you'll realize the blockage of this artery gives rise to one of your medullary syndromes. And you can see the medulla is right over there. So these are close linked to the vertebral arteries and they're right next to the medulla. Now the one thing that I wanted to show you actually was this last part the posterior spinal. Notice the difference. In front, the two anterior spinal were fusing in the anterior fissure, but on the back side, they're both separate. Two posterior spinal arteries in the back, one anterior spinal artery in the front. Here you have the corresponding veins. We won't go in that deeply. You can read them in the book. But that was basically the gross anatomy in general. We learned about the length, which I mentioned from the brainstem, all the way till L1 vertebra in adults, L3 vertebra in babies. You've seen the curvature, the two dilatations in the cervical and lumbar region, coverings of the meninges, as well as the arterial supply. And uh, just a little quickie, I mentioned that uh, the, it's important to actually keep in mind the vertebral bodies because of their association with the spinal cord. The spinal cord passes through the uh, spinal canal of the vertebral bodies. If I were to just enable, hide this one for you, this one has some nice rootlets to show you. Here we go. Look at that. Very nice. You can see the rootlets uh, coming out from the spinal cord. This is part of the peripheral nervous system. Spinal cord itself is actually your part of your central nervous system. But here, the rootlets these are forming the peripheral. The rootless will converge to form a ventral root or anterior root and a dorsal root or posterior root. You can appreciate the ganglion which is in the posterior root. Both will form together the spinal nerve and the spinal nerve will then branch out to form posterior, anterior and lateral branches as you can see right over here. So this gives you a nice idea how these nerves arise from the spinal cord. The denticulated ligament that you see in front of you, oh, let me zoom in again, here we go. The denticulated ligament is actually part of the pia mater. It actually tethers the pia mater to the spinal cord. And uh, in one of the cross sections, you'll be able to appreciate this much better. The last important clinical relevance that I want to mention is the protrusion of the nucleus propulsus from the intervertebral disc. You can appreciate how between the vertebras you have the intervertebral discs. Now these discs are made of two parts, annulus fibrosus and nucleus propulsus. When the center part ruptures through the outer part, the fibrosus, it can actually cause pressure on the spinal cord and the nerve rootlets. In the next 3D model, it will be more clearer. So that will be in the next video.